Well, thank you very much. Good morning again, everyone. Okay, let's just... Uh, just a little bit of history here that Susanna started to talk about. Uh, the original concept behind this is to talk about respect. And obviously respect is so ample and so big that it basically touches every kind of feeling that we have, every kind of attitude that we have. So what we decided to do is, you know, tweak a little bit the idea of talking about respect and talk a little bit more uh, wider. And that's why we brought this under the name of feelings. What we want to do today is study these feelings, but not in the traditional way, not uh, the standard way that we usually do. We want to take a scientific look at feelings. Mm -hmm. That means when I feel something, what happens to you guys when I feel something? When I have a bad feeling about somebody that's not even here, what happens to that somebody? When somebody has a good feeling about me, what happens in between? What happens to everybody around it? Everybody within the same energy. That's what we want to look at. And we are going to see that uh, hopefully we're going to be able to discuss to a level that we're going to see how powerful we are in transmitting good or bad energy. When we uh, do a scientific study like that, just to make it clear, uh, think about something like hate or love. Okay, These are two diff obviously two different types of energies, but scientifically they are energy. So we study these things the same way. It's just that one is a negative, it, it carries a negative sense. The other carries a positive sense, but scientifically, they are the same. Uh, okay, so, let's see. Yes, I'm going to use the button here. Okay. All right, so, just like I was saying, uh, an energy can be something positive or something negative. What's going to dictate that is what I choose it to be. It is my choice to put out good energy, bad energy, good feelings, bad feelings, respect, disrespect. But it all starts from the same point. It all starts with a thought. I have to th think of something and then put it out. When I think of something, right, I have to understand the mechanism that goes around this thought, what makes it happen, what creates it, and it will come obviously from some sort of induction. I am induced to think of that something that I'm going to convert into energy later on. This mental induction has to be coming from the matter that's available for me to think. It's for example, if you're going to uh, uh, build a car, you need the matter that allows you to build a car. You need aluminum, and you need different parts. The mental matter that is available is made of particles, obviously. So if you go backwards here, it all starts by understanding these mental particles, as André Louis says. If we understand these four things here, it's going to be clear for us what happens when I feel something. That's what we want to do. But for me to be able to explain these four things here in this order, because one is, comes after the other, we need to base our uh, talk today in two things. And they are these, the study of subtle bodies and quantum physics. We're not going to become quantum physicists. We're not going to go to a level that's not understandable to anyone, first of all, because I'm not one of them. So we're going to be very, very, very at, at, at the level that's minimum, so we can understand how quantum physics explains everything. So don't be afraid. Don't, don't get out. Okay? All right, so we're going to study this in this order. One, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to go backwards, okay? We're going to start with thought. So some thought comes to my mind and it's going to generate some sort of attitude, some sort of energy, some sort of feeling. Uh, I spoke to you, I think, uh, last time I was here about this book because it has such an interesting story. Uh, it's, a, it's not a spiritist book. It's uh, from a psychologist, uh, Jeffrey Schwartz, and the name of the book is The Mind and the Brain. And he questions the materialistic approach to thought. That's the whole overall idea of the book. And the way he places it is uh, through stories, little stories. One of these stories, which is very interesting, is this. Uh, somewhere out there in one of the planets, in one of the galaxies, um, they start receiving signals from elsewhere. 
So the governor of the planet goes into his equipment and he finds out that the signal is becoming stronger. So he calls his people, his, his people look at it and say, well, we're find out, we, we found out this is coming from planet Earth. So he sends his people to the planet Earth to find out what this is, because they were afraid of it, and then come back and report everything. That was the story. So these people come to planet Earth, and they take their notes, make their everything nice and neat. They go back and tell the governor, we found out what it is. These signals are coming from s some machines that these people have. Uh, they have machines, they're huge. And the governor said, yeah, okay, but who makes these machines? I'm interested in knowing who makes the machines. And they go, oh, there's some people in there. Oh, okay, what are these people made of? They're made of flesh. And the governor said, but flesh doesn't make machines. It's got to be something else. They've got to have something that's more uh, like a carbon quantum base something. No, they have a brain. Yeah, they have a brain. Oh, yeah, what's the brain made of? It's also made of flesh. And then the story continues. It doesn't matter to us anymore from this point. But the thing is, what he puts uh, in term is two things. First of all, what is the origin of the thought? It can't be the flesh. Thought cannot be created from flesh. It just it doesn't even make sense. And that's the point where science, the scientific community, is battling. They're trying to have better understanding exactly how thought is processed from the origin. We don't have a straight answer from science yet, from science. And the other thing that he questions is this. There's got to be something, some intelligent principle that makes the thought be a thought, that converts all this energy, whatever you want to call, and makes the brain generate the thought. But the brain is not the origin of the thought. It's got to be something else. So this floating energy that he, he doesn't call intelligent principle but because it's a spiritist term, but his whole idea is this. There is something intelligent behind everything. And we need to get the scientific community to you know, like go to the lab if you will, and find an answer for this. That's the story about this book. And also for us, same thing. Thought cannot be coming from the brain. For us, it's a lot more obvious than uh, for the scientific community. When we think about thought, that's maybe some complex words, right? When we think about thought, uh, there are two things we should consider. First of all, there's a thought that we call a radiation type. What is a radiation type of thought? It's something like this. Uh, I'm driving and I just remember something. When I get home, I need to call Susanna. And then I keep driving and listening to the music and that's it. So there was a radiation, but it stopped. It was just like a flash and it disappears. And I keep going my driving. And then later on, I think of something else. I need to cook dinner, another radiation. Then I go back to my driving, concentrate on the road and so on and so on. So, so these are flashes. These flashes are radiations. These are fragmented thoughts, okay? Now, there's another type of thought, which is what we call thought forms, okay? That's the words Andrea Luiz uses in his books. A thought form is more like an ideoplastic uh, thing. It is something that we think and we sustain. So, for example, I don't like that person. I really hate him. He makes me nervous. I need to do something about this person. I hate my job, I hate my boss, or I love that person, I wanna be with that person. Anything that I sustain, okay, is a thought form. Now, you can imagine the difference between a radiation that goes away in fractions and fractions of seconds and something that you sustain. So you're feeding some thought, some energy with the sustainability of that thought, okay? And that is where trouble can take place. Trouble if it's a negative energy, a good thing if it's a positive energy. It all starts on our ability and willingness to create thought forms, meaning thoughts that we are going to sustain and hold. Some of these thoughts are for minutes, some are for days, some are for years. I hate that person because in 1960 something he did that to me. So the thought form has been present for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, incarnation after incarnation. It goes really that far. So this is the problem type of thought. Okay, this is what we need to understand and study. And thoughts are 
when we think about something, like I said before, we are induced to that thought. So something has to, around us, will trigger that to take place, okay? And that's what Andrea Luis called the mental induction. Something induces me or somebody else to uh, create a thought. So in this book, unfortunately it's not out in English yet, I think it's going to be later on this year, right? Yeah, Mechanisms of Mediumship. It's a detailed book about, uh, it has a lot of physics in the book. Uh, physics to our level, not physics to the physicist's level, to our level. And uh, he explains a lot about the floating energies and changing energies. We're going to go to the very basic level so we can pass the message along. So what is the influence of this mental field that we create? Think about this, for example. Let's just say we go out here and we set up a small campfire. Okay, it probably wouldn't make too much of a difference. Okay, now think about the same campfire, a small, just a small campfire like that, in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the Everglades, for example, in the dark of the night. There's absolutely nothing around us for miles and miles and hundreds of miles. Just think of that. If you're really close to that, okay, there's two things you're gonna perceive this as. First of all, heat and second, light, okay? As we go far from the source, okay, what happens? I'm gonna have less heat and less ability to point to the source of the light. I still see the light. Sometimes you're driving in the dark and you, have, you see some blurry light up there. You can tell there's a city in there, but you can't tell where the light is coming from. Oh, it's coming from the second floor on that building. You can't tell that you know you have a, a blurry idea there's light in there. The same thing happens here. As we go along, as we go away, far away from... Okay, we'll continue that way. As we go along, uh, without... Thank you. Without paying attention to heat and light, we're going to feel the effect. There's a point where I don't feel the heat anymore because I'm too far from it, from the influence of that campfire. And there's a point where the light doesn't make, doesn't uh, touch me anymore, doesn't, uh, it's not perceivable anymore, because I'm not within the mental field anymore. So when we go to the spiritual realm, that's exactly what it is, the mental field, the influence of the mental field. So when I think of something, I am this campfire here. Everybody around me is subject to that field. You might not perceive it, you might not see it, you might not care for it, but it's there, I created it. And each one of, of you does the same thing, so there's a tremendous overlapping of mental fields, which obviously is gonna bring some sort of result. So the mental field is not visible, obviously. We don't see with our eyes. And it's not only from incarnates to incarnates. This is mental matter here. That's, it transcends physical worlds. Now, what Andre Luis tells us is, the, the fire, the, the, if you think of the campfire, more fire means more uh, uh, light, farther away, and more heat, right? The same thing is with us. More concentration and persistence means the wider my mental field is, I will, uh, um, the radius of my uh, mental field, my thought, is a lot more. What is persistence? Is the thought form that we just saw. It is that feeling that I hate this thing. And you keep hating it, hating it, and hating it. That's what you're propagating. That, so, you, so your sustainability is making, is keeping the fire up. You're really, literally keeping the fire up. Good feelings will do the same thing, okay? If you really have a good feeling in your heart, you're propagating that, and it will be, the, the fire will be, you know, uh, more powerful as you put more persistency and concentration on it. So concentration, meaning uh, all I think of is that thing. So when you hate something, for example, you forget everything about uh, around you because you're so concentrated on that. You're really powerful in disseminating that bad energy. And people around us or around you are gonna feel it. Now, this mental induction comes from mental matter. 
Okay, what makes this induction take place? And this is studied in physics through the studies of uh, waves. Okay, uh, it is in the spiritual world as it is in our physical world. It is a lot easier, obviously, to explain based on our physical world. The way uh, physics, uh, the quantum physics explains to us, or in general, physics explains to us is this. Think about a string. I have a string here. And we attach that string to the wall, and I hold the, the other end here. As I do this, okay, you will see the waves being formed, okay, obviously. And if I do faster, you will see the waves coming closer together like this. If I go really, 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 really fast, you're not going to see a string anymore. It's going to be blur. You cannot even tell what it is. Okay, it's like a fan. When a fan uh, is, you know, a fan is not running. Okay, you have three of those uh, paddles, right? When you bring it up, it's still three. You can still count them. Higher speed means uh, maybe six. At a really higher speed, it's a circle. You lose the ability to tell the source. You lose the form. Okay, and it's the same thing here. When I go with the string easily, you can see the form, so you have more control on the process, if you will. When I go really fast, you lose control because it's outside of your ability to comprehend that. And the same thing happens to these wavelengths. Wavelengths is when I do a string like this, it could be something easy like this, or something more radical, like the green one. And we, the, the physics measures this. Uh, by taking two of the top waves and they call that wavelength. The name is not really important but you can tell just by looking at the picture that the wavelength of the green wave is a lot shorter than the blue. Okay, Just look at the picture so the green is shorter. That's how names like uh, short waves, mid waves, uh, long waves in physics take place. In the early 70s, 60s and 70s, uh, we had radios that were called short wave radios. We would just turn up the radio like an a, old AM radio. Okay, they were short waves. You would just uh, turn it on and you would uh, get signals from stations in France, Germany, Japan, without any of the technology that we had today. How come? Because when you have a short wave, okay, Short wave is the one on the top. Really, 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 really fast. At very high frequency. Okay? <coughs> the propagation goes very far. The mental field of branches is enormous. The radius is very, very big. And on short, for example, FM. Okay, FM, the radio, FM radio is very short wave. It doesn't go too far. So you need repeaters all across the city to be able to propagate the signal over and over and over again. Otherwise, you would drive on a turnpike. You wouldn't get anything, okay? So a high uh, short waves will go a long way, okay? What does it matter to us spiritists? It matters because thought is a wave. Thought is a wave. So I can think short waves or long waves. And it's my choice to Decide. Well, I'm going to show you how that the process takes place. When I concentrate, when I concentrate, remember con concentration and persistence. When I concentrate, they are extremely short, so they go very far. <coughs> the activity of my mental field is much higher than if it's a long wave. Now, um, this is a graphic that shows, for example, we can have very, very, very short waves. If I do like this, very, very fast. And towards this side of the screen, there are very long waves. So when I think, I generate waves that can be anywhere in between. Okay? Now, can I go very, 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 very extremely high and extremely low? No. That's where Andrea Luis comes to tell us this. The very, very high frequencies, what is very high frequency? A lot of concentration, a lot of persistence. Okay, they are for angelical legions. We're not there. We can't do this. Our ability, we, we can do uh, short waves to a certain point, but not to the max. 
okay? On the other extreme here, very long waves, meaning almost no thought, are the animals. Yeah? They have fragmented thought, like the monkey, he thinks for a couple of minutes, he doesn't think anymore, then he thinks another couple of minutes, then he doesn't think anymore. It's all fragmented, they, they don't sustain. You see the difference? Now think about this, us and the thought forms sustaining one of these thoughts that we had. The animal can't do that. It will go away. It's more like radiations. It will go away. Us, we are in the middle. On that side, a thought form sustained can be sustained almost like forever, right? So people like Jesus, for example, or spirits rather, like Jesus, when they think, right? they are able to sustain that and make it happen because they won't let go. That feeling of love that these high awareness people in general bring to us, that's what it is. They sustain that for such a long time that it will take place. It will happen. We don't have that ability. Okay, we are in the middle. In the middle, we can divide this to better understand in three parts or three sections. Shorter waves are basic vibrations. Basic vibrations means the car in idle, for example. The car is not running, it's, it's not moving, but it's running. Okay, it's just to keep it going. That's what it is. So we have to have basic vibrations so the body physically lives. That's all it is. I don't have to be thinking anything. I can just be, you know, for a couple of minutes there, just like disconnected, but I'm living. So these are the basic vibrations. The second uh, part here, attention, reflection, and prayer. That's when you start to be more, I would say, maybe serious or put a little more concentration on things, all right? So the thought form generated under those circumstances are different than the ones generated here. We can sustain those for longer. And again, I can sustain a good thought or a bad thought. It doesn't matter. We're talking about sustainability, okay? It could be good or bad. So attention, reflection, when I put all my attention and I really reflect on something, I'm going to be able to sustain that thought form for longer. And when I really put my emotions in it, you know, I really do from the bottom of the heart, from the really, you know, all of that, you forget about the world and you put everything in it. That's the highest type that we as incarnates are able to do. So we're going to generate shorter waves. So. At times, we are just basic vibrations and not really important thoughts. But at times, we do have the ability to do thoughts in which the mental field is much higher, much more, uh, the, the radius of the field is much wider than before. So we do have that ability. We probably don't use it. I don't know if we know that. Maybe not. It's hard for us to know because it's not something that we can measure ourselves. It's not tangible. But it's all told to us, uh, we are told that by Andrea Luis. So if we look at this graphic here, how does it happen? What makes it happen? A mental process, it starts with what Andrea Luis calls the mental particles. You have to act on the particles of the universe to put a thought out. It's not particle like this, the microphone, the co remote control. We're going to the minimum, way <laughs> deeper than an atom here, okay? This is what it means. If you think of an atom, okay, what is an atom for our understanding? Just us here. We're not scientists, we're not anything like that. An atom is a point of energy that we call nucleus and other points of energy floating around it. We call electrons. For us, that's all we need to know. These are, that's what an atom is. Okay, so we got a, a nucleus here, a concentration of energy and other energies around. Just like something here. When we are in thoughts of basic vibrations, okay, meaning we're not really impacting the universe, if you will, okay, what happens is that I am able with my thought to move the entire atom as a whole. I can shape the atom and manipulate the atom to produce the energy that I want to produce. But I can, I can only do this to the entire atom. I can't break it down, I can't go in it. It's just a whole atom, okay? It's like the atom for me in basic vibrations is like a black box, okay? Now, when you put your attention, your concentration on it, the thing changes a little bit because you can act inside the atom. 
Okay, if you look at the atom again, it's a point of energy, the nucleus, and electrons floating around it. Okay, I represented the nucleus with these white and red balls. Okay, and the electron is spinning around it, it's running around it in orbit. When I put my energy in such a way that I concentrate, my attention is in it, like a prayer, intercessory prayer and all of that, what happens is I can touch the electron inside the atom with my thought. I will tell the atom, this is what I want you to do for me. Now, what we know is when you energize the atom to a certain level, and that's pure physics, you will jump over to a next orbit. That's a physics fact. That's not Andre Luiz, that's not Luis Lima. When you uh, inflate an electron with energy, you will jump over to its next orbit and then the next one and the next one, something like this. Now, when the electron goes from one orbit to the other, what happens is it generates light. That light that we see here that takes place is what we call aura. Our aura comes from here from this, the light that is generated by my thoughts. That's why people say, oh, your aura is all this and all that, because my energy is this or that. I'm moving the electrons with good energy or bad energy. That's all it means. Now I can go even higher. I'm all the way in the deep emotions area, meaning I'm really I'm giving myself to this cause, which could be again, good or bad, but I'm really concentrating on it, the max that I can with all my possibilities. I'm gonna go even further down into the atom. I'm gonna move the nucleus of the atom. I'm gonna shake the nucleus of the atom. Now, if you look at this, the three possibilities, where can I do more? I'm gonna use a, a word that we use in our everyday, okay? Where can I do more damage? Okay, when I control the nucleus or the whole atom as a black box. When I control the nucleus, because then I have control on the core of the atom. From there, it will do what I want. I, it, it's held captive on my thought, if you will. So, obviously, I'm going to be a lot more powerful when I put my emotions into something than when I don't, than I'm in basic vibration. And if it's a good energy, it's going to create something good within the mental field. If it's something bad, it's going to generate something bad within the mental field. Now, we saw these three possibilities, right? I can shake or I can touch in the core, the nucleus, the electrons, or the whole uh, atom. This is just a, a, a short of what I just said, okay? Just recapping, because it's really important. When I do the whole atom, okay, I'm in basic vibrations. My mental power is not all that much, okay? When I'm able to concentrate a little bit more in reflection, prayer, attention, concentration, then I can do a little bit more, but it's still not the max that I can do. When I really put all my emotions into something, and I do that with all my emotions, when you do something with all your heart, okay, then you have a lot more uh, transforming power, as Andrea Luis says. So, we have the ability to it is our choice to do one way or another. I can do something with, yeah, let me do that. Or I can really know. I want to do some sort of charity, for example. Yeah, let me, let me give him 10 bucks. Yeah, that's fine. But that's basic vibration. Okay? If you really want to do something else to the next level, you need to go deep emotions caliber. Because that's what's going to make the world respond to your thoughts. The, the universe, the atoms on the universe, the cosmic fluid, will respond to our thoughts. Okay, I don't know if the idea is clear here, that's really important. I don't know, if, is, that, is that all right, is that clear? Okay. All right, so these mental particles that Andre Luis says, look, the, now this is what's coming from Andre Luis, on top of everything that we said. Everything that I said here in the last two uh, slides are from science, right? scientific community. This is Andre Luis now. We are in an ocean of subtle energy, okay, whose surprising elements transcend the periodical table of chemical elements. Stop, stop, stop. What is the periodical table of chemical elements? I don't know if you remember in school, the little distribution that has lithium and oxygen and nitrogen and all of those things. 
these are, that list of things is what we know as humans, is what the scientific community was able to find and list to us in a more understandable way, something that we can memorize a little bit better. But that's not all of it. And that's what Andrea Luis uh, is talking about here. It transcends. So there are elements that we don't know that participate into this mental field and they're not part of the table. All right, so when we think as scientists, uh, scientific community, we're not getting everything. We're missing part of it because there are things that are not being uh, interpreted. And he continues on the same paragraph. In addition, there are corpuscular corpuscular formations based on atomic systems in different vibrational conditions. Stop again, stop again. Vibrational conditions, it's one of those three things, okay? There are times that the atomic system, meaning the atoms, will vibrate in a way that we don't know as scientists. Science does not know. That's what Andrea Luiz is telling us. At times, things will vibrate in a way that the physicist looking at it through his equipment, whatever it is, will not catch because it's different. The equipment is looking into something that we know, right? We can measure uh, uh, temperature because we have something called a thermometer that measures it. But you can't measure uh, the intensity of light with that. It's not the appropriate equipment. So we don't have the appropriate equipment to measure these vibrations, okay? And he tells us this could be negative or positive charges, which are gonna be positive feelings or negative feelings. Good thoughts, bad thoughts. It's always our choice. We choose how to handle these atoms. It comes from us. It, it's, it's a choice, okay? All right, so all of this is how the thought is generated. Now, once we generate the thought, what happens in two things? First of all, with us, before it leaves, before it goes out to you, and then second, what happens to you, okay? To explain what happens inside of me, within my domain, first, we're gonna study the subtle bodies. When it goes out of me and it goes to you, that's what quantum, quantum physics explains. So when we talk about the subtle bodies, uh, Alan Kardec uh, describes what we call the three bodies, which is the physical body, the perispirit, and the spirit. Now, Dr. Andre Luiz, he goes a little further down. He takes the perispirit and he subdivides in three. So we end up with five uh, bodies. He divides the perispirit into mental body, spiritual body, an etheric double. Okay, we're gonna analyze a little bit of each one of these. The reason why we need to go through this is the thought is generated all the way up there in the spirit, but it will have a, a physical impact on my body. So we need to understand how it comes down, that this sense of energy all the way from the spirit to the body. That's why we need to study a little bit, a couple of minutes on each one of these bodies, okay? So obviously we know the spirit is the principle, the intelligent principle, and you will use the cosmic fluid to generate thoughts and everything, okay? That's our, our spiritual history defines our vices and virtues. That changes as we go along in our evolutionary path, it will change, okay? So today, for example, I have a certain list of vices and virtues. It will maybe be different uh, 40, 50 incarnations from today. But for now, I have my list. When I pick up, literally, we're gonna see how, when I pick up a, a thought, I can pick up from the vices bucket or from the virtues bucket. And it will generate a mental field with positive or negative energy, okay? From the spirit, next one down is the uh, mental body. The mental body is responsible for the production of thought. That's where thought is generated. It receives a command from the spirit, okay? The spirit is the main source of the thought. And through the mental body, it will generate all of this thing that we discussed in the past few minutes here, okay? Then the mental body is the next one down. The mental body is formed, you can see here, the structured 
through electrons and photons. So science doesn't know that because they can't measure that. So this comes from Andrea Luis. But the structure of the spiritual body is very, very similar to what science understands as our physical body. It, it has electrons, electrons and photons, but remember, in different vibrations. So we can't see, we can't catch. But it's still the, the same uh, method of studying applies. Okay. Now the spiritual body has the vital centers. So, and the most important thing about the spiritual body is, it is uh, the Hindus they call the karmic body. For this reason right here, it carries the law of cause and effect, law of karma, if you will. Whatever we do, it's going to be registered by that body. It's going to be in that body. So. If we do something good, it's going to be registered by the spiritual body. If we do something bad, it's, always going to, it's also going to be there. Okay? Next one down, the etheric body, which is the gross, denser part of the perispirit, very close to the physical body. Okay? It holds the chakras, the vital centers. Okay? So if something comes down from spirit all the way down, mental body and so on and so, and it's some bad energy that I'm sending out, it will affect my etheric double because it passes through it. It will disalign or misalign or impact the alignment of my chakras. This is even before it gets out to you. That's only me. That's, this is happening inside my five bodies, okay? Before it leaves. You, you don't know anything yet because I haven't sent the thought out yet. It's just being processed within my own domain here, okay? So, the, my chakras can be all uh, out of whack, if you will, depending on what kind of energy I put out. And then it finally gets to my physical body, which is the bloody paper. That's where the spirit is gonna spurge all his bad energy, okay? So the physical body also is part of the process. I'm gonna feel it. If I have bad feelings all the time, my body will display that in a way or another, sooner or later. You will display that. Okay, so, now that we understood a little bit about, about uh, each body, how does the process take place? How does this energy, this thought, comes down? Okay, we know it's a complicated process because it touches all of my bodies, okay? Now, when it gets to physical, okay, what happens to the physical level? I need to understand one cell. We are seven trillion cells. If I understand one, I can understand the colony of cells. In one cell, what happens is something like this. We divide the cell into parts for understanding purposes. The center, this pinkish part here, is a nucleus. Everything else is called the cytoplasm, okay? The cytoplasm has a lot of things. We're not interested in any of those except for one, okay? We are interested in these brownish, orange things here. They're called mitochondrion. The mitochondrion in the cell is what processes metabolism, okay? Mitochondrion takes oxygen, water, and uh, food into the cell, processes and generates energy, okay? It's like our digestive system. Okay, you take water and food, it processes, and it generates the vital energy. It gives us physical energy, biological energy. So the mitochondrion does the same thing at the cell level. Okay, so this is the purpose of the mitochondrion. That's from biology. Now here's where it gets more interesting. Then comes Andre Luis. And this is what it says, okay? By means of the mitochondrion, okay, the mind, transmits to the physical vehicle that it conforms to. What is the physical vehicle? It's the body, the physical body, okay? So by, the means, by means of mitochondria, the mind transmits to the body all of its states, happy or unhappy. That means happiness is here, unhappiness is here, and everything in between gets stamped on each mitochondria of each cell. One cytoplasm has many mitochondria. It's not the same number of mitochondria per cell. Liver cells have more than uh, skin cells, they're different, but they all have mitochondria inside. So the mitochondria 
which processes metabolism, reads the information from the mind before processing. Look at how much, how powerful this thing is. And then it will disturb or balance the cause and effect. All the balancing of the en or imbalancing of energy has to do with that. It's for example, uh, if you eat, let's say, the same thing every morning in your breakfast, okay? So supposedly, supposedly, you should feel the same always, let's say one hour after your breakfast, you should always be feeling well or feeling bad, depends on what your breakfast is. But in theory, you should feel the same way, let's say one hour after your breakfast. One particular day, you went to bed and you had a fight with your partner, your wife, whatever it is, and then you go to breakfast and then one hour after that breakfast you're not feeling well, things didn't go well, you, you feel your body is different. Your metabolism didn't process the same thing. That's the same here with the mitochondria. It doesn't process metabolism, cell metabolism, always the same way, because it reads the state of mind. So the days that I subscribe to Revenge, Revenge uh, radio station, the days that I subscribe to that, my metabolism is one. My mitochondria is acting one way. The day that I turn off that radio and I subscribe to Radio Love, it changes because my mitochondria is doing a different work. <coughs> my cell is benefiting more or less, obviously, according to these mental states. So the mental state goes down to the physical level, to each mitochondria inside of each cell. So some days we like, we have a fight with the boss and then the rest of the day is all ruined, I can't do anything, I can't think. Because you are stamping your mental state on your physical body. And here's the explanation from Andrea Luis. Okay? All right, now these are cells in general. In, in general. Now, one type of cell, which is the brain cells, they're di slightly different, the neurons, they're slightly different because there are cells that have a little bit more than just the nucleus and the mitochondria and everything else. These cells uh, are shown here. The red spot in the, uh, not the red spot, I'm sorry, the black spot in there is the nucleus, okay? So it has more than just the nucleus. Around the nucleus, it is, let me see if I have a, No, okay, that's fine. Around the nucleus, the orange area is the cytoplasm. But you can see, off the cytoplasm it has all these tree of things and little no, things like that. I'm just gonna give you a name so it's easier for me to, to talk to you. These little things on the left side here are called dendrites. Okay, these are little tubes, little, uh, like little pieces of wire, you will. On the right side here, you have something called axon, okay? What is so that important? The importance is these things attach to each other, okay? Dendrites from one cell attach to axons on the other, okay, just like that, and they will form a chain. That chain is what transmits the information in the brain. That chain is your wire, okay, that's going to transmit the information. It is formed like this. Okay, and this is pure biology. Now, why is that important to us? Because of this. When you look into these dendrites, if you expand them, they are little, like little straws, if you will. They're microtubules, that's the technical name. They are straws, little straws, just like that, waiting for something to happen. They are literally waiting for things to happen, meaning another cell will come up and uh, attach to it. While that's not taking place, they're just waiting, they're little straws. Now, before we go into what André Louis says, uh, in 2007, uh, it, a book was published here in the United States, it's called The Quantum Brain, by uh, Jeffrey Satinover. He's a very well-known uh, writer, and what he said is this, it, it generated a lot of, uh, a lot of interest in this, this is what he said. When he was a kid, okay, he tells a little story about himself, but when he was a kid, he had a microscope. And the first time he saw uh, the conception, he saw the very first cell. So you, I think it was me here, now I found out. 
free will. I could have not done it. Okay, so just continuing here. He said the very first time he saw the first cell, right after conception, the first cell, okay, he would look into the microscope and suddenly, so he, you're looking at, you're looking at the process, you keep looking at, suddenly some little straws, like they go, kind of they go up to the air, like if they were waiting for something, and they stay up for a few seconds and then the cell divides in absolutely two, but absolutely equal, geometrically speaking. And then the straw, now I have straws on the left cell and on the right cell, because now I got two of them, they go down. Then nothing happens for a little bit, and then these things go up again, and these become two, and these become two more. Then the, these dendrites go down. And he, he could never understand that, it's strange. And years go by and we don't get anywhere with this. Science doesn't know what these straws are doing there, okay? And finally, he became a biologist, he went to study this, he became a professional, made a lot of research. And the only explanation he came up with is the possibility that this has something to do with some people call spirit, some people call God, he puts a lot of names, okay? Because he's not, you know, biased into any kind of thing. But that's his only explanation. There's got to be some energy. It is an energy, obviously. We don't see on the microscope. There's got to be some sort of energy that goes through the straw, down to the cell, and makes the process happen. When this book was published in 2007, a lot of people in the area, in the field, biology and all of that, started concentrating on this, studying more on that. So we're getting there. Don't, don't know what we know. We're getting there. All right, that's the technical part. What does Andrea Luis tell us about all of this? Here we go. The nucleus, nucleus in a neuron, okay, is surrounded by protoplasm, protoplasm and cytoplasm, okay? Housing different things. Mitochondria is one of them, housing different things, melanin, and a brownish pigment tightly related to the spiritual body. Now, if you're a scientist, you're looking at the microscope, you can't see that. So your assumption, your whole work, is going to be based on something that is, to say the least, partial. You don't have the whole information, okay? Uh, so this pigment tightly related to the spiritual body having an extremely important role in the sustainability of thoughts. Mm -hmm. That means when you think, and it's a radiation, nothing really happens but when you're sustaining that you're using all your the power of your brain to be processing that sustainability right to make this thing alive keep this thought alive if you will through these dendrites okay now these dendrites and he keeps saying here considerably more available in adulthood and later in life so that means as you age, you have more of these things, more of this pigment. So you have supposedly, supposedly, better ability to receive this energy that comes through the straws, dendrites. Isn't that interesting? Very interesting, very, it's very deep, okay? He continues on the same paragraph, all right? In addition to that pigment, okay, that substance, which is invisible to the cells during activity. So scientists look into the microscope, they don't see it. But Andrea Luis gives us a, a, a hint here. They don't see it. It's, they spread through the cytoplasm and through the dendrites, the straws, okay? But these substances that are not visible, they are revealed by the use of corants. A lot of times you're gonna do a blood test, they have to put some corants on it to see the results, okay? So if the scientist put some sort of corants in there, they will see it. So it's not visible as you look at it, but it is there and, it, and science knows because that happens in the lab. They see when they put these corants, things change, so they know there's something in there. We might not know, a scientific community might not know what it does or what it's for, but it's there, it's detectable, okay? Continuing here, uh, the substance, this substance represents psychic nutrition. What is this? That is your dendrites, your 
uh, straws waiting for information from a higher level of energy. That's what it is. <coughs> That's how the information gets passed along. Okay? Absorbing via the spiritual body, so it's sent in from one of those five bodies coming down uh, the ladder through respiration do, during the physical repose. That means when we are sleeping, that's when we receive more of those things. And if you continue here to the end, for the restoration of very and irreplaceable selves. Right, let's stop and analyze this thing. How can I replace irreplaceable selves? Irreplaceable selves is a, a, a term used by us in biology. Okay, It means cells are sick or not doing their function properly. Something is not right with these cells. But via your thoughts, you can send down a message to your cells and fix that. That's what it's saying here. Don't we see a lot of examples? People with cancers and they decide, I'm not going to have this thing anymore. And it goes out. And that's it. They're cured. No medicine, no surgery, no anything. Don't we know a lot of medium cases? Every, it's becoming so much popular, that kind of uh, information in our society here. That's this. Behind the scenes, when you read the news, which might, for us here, spiritists might not be news anymore. It's just another very happy case that we are happy for. But when you read that, this is what goes behind the scenes. That person decided that it was going to use He's just got to take his ability, his deep emotion thoughts, and send it down to the physical body and make it happen. Uh, Andre Luis uses one very interesting expression to refer to our cells. He says, our cells are domesticated infinitesimal animalcules. Stop. Animalcules. Tiny, 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 tiny animals. Infinitesimal a million times smaller than what you thought, okay? Domesticated, obey something. There's a hierarchy, obey something higher level. That's what it is. Each of ourselves, through the mitochondria, obeys the spirit. It is no accident. There's a whole thing behind this. And that's right here in Andrea Luis. It's right there. Anybody can read it. Okay? That's not me. That's him. All right. So all of this took place when I came up with the thought. But I haven't throw out, thrown out this thought, thought yet. Now I'm going to throw it to you. Okay? We're going to propagate this thought to outside of my little domain here. This is explain, what happens is explained by uh, quantum physicists. Don't get scared. Okay? We're going to go very slow. It's actually a lot of common sense what I'm going to show here. They were able to, first of all, understand, and second, to explain to us that are not quantum physicists how, how it works. Uh, they put a little explanation together that we, it, it became very well known. It's called the double slit experiment. Okay? What is this? We know that thought is energy, right? This is clear now, I guess. All right, this is what they did. We are used to particles, things that we can touch, physical particles. That's the physics that we study for 400 years, 500 years since Newton and so and so and so. We, we already know everything about it, okay? So let's start from there because we know this thing. So if we get a, a, a cannon with balls, marble balls, for example, put a slit, okay, and fire up, and put a panel in the back, it is kind of obvious for us that the expected result is something like that, right? That's common sense, right? If I put two slits, what do I expect? How about the same thing, right? This is pure common sense here, okay? And that's what it is in the physical Newtonian world. No big deal here. Now, thoughts are not particles. Thoughts are waves. So we need to understand what happens. Instead of uh, a cannon of marble, little marble balls, if we have a cannon of electrons, that's complicated. So let's understand a wave that's more visible to us, which is in between the marble and the actual wave of electrons. Let's put waves in a water tank. It's easier for us to visualize. If I do something like this in one slit, 
Okay, my panel is in the back. How is it going to impact the panel? Something like that. Right? A lot more in the very center aligned with this ledge, a little bit less around it. But it will impact around it a little bit. Are you okay with this? Mm -hmm. Common yeah. sense. Yeah, Common sense. Let's put a second slit in that water, in, in the tank of water. Here comes the second slit. So when I fire up, the waves are gonna break in two because I got two slits. And they're gonna overlap. At times they will add to each other, at times they will offset. So the impact on the panel is now different. Now just compare, before we go ahead, just compare. Remember, the two slits and the marble balls, how much did I impact the panel versus how much do I impact here? Look at the difference. It is much more powerful, the impact that I have on the water tank than on physical particles, okay? So, now let's go to a different type of wave, the wave of thought, which is a bunch of electrons. So we're gonna fire up a cannon of electrons. And what science found out is, with one slit, it's just what we expect. It's just like the marble balls. When you put a second slit, it will act as the water tank. The electrons are gonna mark or impact the panel, just like that, as you see on the picture here. Okay? Now, what does it matter to us? What does this have anything to do with us? Here it is. These two slits that you see here, okay, are me and Susanna. I'm thought, I'm, I'm thinking on the left side, she's thinking on the right side. Those are us. The panel is Marcelo. When the two of us think something about him, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad, this is still physical, right? It's still uh, physics. When we think something about him, he gets all that much of an impact. Just two people, put a third slit. Put a fourth slit. Now, make as many slits as the population and make the board some artist in Hollywood or some politician. I want you to understand the impact of this thing. Do you understand? That's just true, just, just true. The power that the two of us have with our thoughts compared to what we usually would think of, oh, we're just two, uh, the 30 people here, two of us is not gonna make any difference. You will, you will. That's the kind of difference that we do make. So when I decide to talk bad about somebody and somebody else here in the same room aligns with my thought, then I just brought into the equation slit number two. And then a third person, ah, yeah, no, really, that person is no good. I just brought a third slit. And it goes and it goes and it goes. Now, at times and many, many, many times, we are the board. Right? At times we are the board. So, what do we say? What is the spiritist concept of all of this? Pray, but be aware, right? Isn't that what we say? The spiritist? Right? The pray is when you fire the cannon. You don't want to fire the cannon with a bad thought. You want to fire the cannon with a good thought. But you have to protect yourself. So you have to be, you know, uh, aligned with your thoughts and your moral standards and everything that's going to make you stand when somebody attacks you. Your board is not going to go down. When I say yours, obviously I'm part of it. It's just a, a linguistic way of making a point, okay? So, if you think of the panel, I think that has, because it's something visual, okay, it's an explanation in visual terms that uh, they put to us, I think it's very easy for us to grab the idea, okay? All right, so it's all a matter of choice. Energy is energy. What defines if it's gonna be good or bad is my choice, is what I make out of this energy. I know I have the power, it's been demonstrated here. I know I have the power, I know how much I can do, 
okay? It is gonna be my choice. So when I think of somebody, I can think good or bad. If it's gonna be bad, it's better to be a radiation. And we have the ability to make that change. I really don't like that person. Oh, no, no, forget it. That was a radiation. No, I really don't like that person. How can I make, uh, how can I kill him? How can I, you see, that's thought form. It is my own ability. It doesn't depend on anybody else. It's my choice. I can start into like a thought form and rapidly change to a radiation when it's not something good. Because the first to go through that is myself. Through the chain of subtle bodies. I am the first to be all of that. Before it even leaves my domain out to the person that I'm thinking of. Now, when we create some thoughts, remember the, uh, the waves that we cannot do all the way up to the left, which is the angelical legions? We, can't, we don't have the ability as incarnates to do that. Our frequency is not, does not allow us to do that. And part of it has to do with the cos cosmic fluid of the planet. The cosmic fluid of the planet allows certain manipulations. We have the ability to do certain things, not all. We have the ability to do certain uh, thought forms, not all. Obviously, we want to be, we want to be the Jesus of our times, each one of us. But with the ability that we have to do vibrations and the and the uh, cosmic fluid, we can't. We have to be at a much higher standard before that. We have to, it's a graduation, we have to go higher and higher and higher and higher. Being able to do higher frequencies more and more and more and more and more. And then we get into the ability to do very high frequencies. Okay? Now, I talked to you about in the beginning that we discussed this in the level of respect and disrespect, which applies to everything that we said. Now, one interesting thing to know is this, when I decide to respect somebody or disrespect somebody, that impacts me, but impacts at a collective level as well, because of the mental state that I generate. If I decide to disrespect, for example, I'm going to disrespect Susanna right now, and one of you doesn't like her, you're going to come into my mental field, you're going to be my second slit, my third slit, my fourth slit, and she's going to be on the board, like, She's going to get home, probably drained. She's going to feel it. And a lot of times we get home like that and we don't know why. I didn't do anything different. I didn't do any exercise. I didn't eat anything different. I didn't get stressed. But you are the board. So it might be the case where there's a lot of people throwing bad energy at you. Okay? All right. So respect above all is auto self-respect. Self-respect. When I don't respect somebody, the first thing that I didn't respect is any of my 70 trillion cells through their mitochondria and the dendrites. I didn't respect my brain. I didn't respect my skin. I didn't respect anything that is part of my physical body. Okay. Quick recap. If we have to take, I think, three things out of here today, okay? In three words, because a lot of talk is a lot, of, a lot more difficult to maybe take the idea. In three words, I would take this, the mitochondria. Just remember what it is. Remember mitochondria? It stamps the mental state on each cell of my body. Mitochondria has to do with the mental state. It will process metabolism according to what my state, my mental state is. Word number two, the dendrites. They will read my mind, okay? my thoughts and will process that into the body. I am the first to process the thought that I'm going to have. Good thought will process something good in my body. Bad thought will process something bad. And the third word is the panel. Remember the panel. The panel, okay, more slits means uh, your campfire has, you know, a, a better, has probably more wood to generate more fire. Okay. The panel, I think it's, it, it's, it's maybe the most important thing that we spoke about today. 
because it shows us visually, which is very easy for us to understand, the ability that we have to impact others, and ourselves, obviously, but others. So, you know, at times we just want to talk uh, bad things about somebody. That somebody might be very close to us. It's just that in that minute, in those, I don't know, that maybe that one hour, that window of one hour, you're, you're feeling something bad about the person. But if you express that, this is what you're doing. You don't have to express. Make it a radiation. Okay, it goes away. It doesn't do anything. And right, that's what I wanted to bring to you today. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A, right? Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. Santa Cruz, you have a little more. Wow, awesome. Thank you, Louis. Um, we have a little bit of time, so I have some thoughts. Yeah. Um, disorganized thoughts. I'll try <laughs> to organize them as, um, as we talk. I'm going to go back on your presentation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Take this. Okay. That's a lot of clicks. <laughs> oh, we're getting there. Okay. One more. Okay, so one thing that um, called my attention, and I think that um, spiritism is very unique about, is the fact that, you know, soon we're going to have in English some of these books available where Andrew Lewis, way back then before science is where it is right now, was telling us about all those things, but spiritism is going to uh, put together all the scientific knowledge, but also together with the moral part, the, the, the ethics, with the, the message of Christ. So when we look at all those things that Lewis talked about, and we go back to this slide, uh, certainly is very powerful to know all the things that we have just learned because we become more aware of how our thoughts are impacting ourselves, how our thoughts are in some ways um, setting up our uh, present and future because um, the quality of our thoughts are harmonizing or disharmonizing our own body and everything is being archived in ourselves. So it's going to express in our future lives. But just bear in mind when we go back here to this um, slide, and we look at the spirit, and we see here the spirit is the intelligent principle, and in the spirit are the vices and the virtues. What this is telling us is, you can have all this knowledge, but if we don't go back to the very source of everything, which is our spirit, we can't make a change. We can know all that, but if we don't know what goes deep inside ourselves, know thyself, Know your feelings. Why do you feel the way you feel? Why do you act the way you act? Where is this coming from? Okay, I'm having a thought of anger. It's human. But what's generating this thought in first place? Because everything that we talk about is that Louis just brought to us comes from this deeper source, which is the spirit. So today he spoke about you know, more like the scientific aspects of it. But next week, we are going to be talking about the spirit. We're going to be talking about the tools that spiritism gives us, both in the, uh, in, the, in the philosophy of spiritism, but also in things that Jesus had told us that's going to um, target the very, very source of all the happiness and unhappiness that we experience. Because we know all these things, so now what? What do we do from now on? It's not going to change the way we feel. That's the work, that's the journey of enlightenment. We know all these things that make us more aware of our responsibility and our role in the universe, 
But the gist, gist of the work is to understand and to work at the spirit level. So I just want to highlight that when you said, and I took a few notes here, when you said that Jesus was able to sustain his thought, what came to my mind is it wasn't a matter of sustaining love. He was love. Yeah, he was love. Right? So you can sustain what you become. And that is truly uh, the goal is to become. Once you become, you have no trouble sustaining. Yeah. So I just thought that that was a, a, a really neat idea. Um, another thing that I think is important to talk about, the idea of the board. So you talk about the board and it just, not that you meant this way, but one thing that came to my mind is sound that sounds like the board is a very passive entity, right? And so I think it's important to say that, yes, it is in the experiment. It's gonna take whatever it comes, but we are not passive entities. We're not passive boards. So, and this is a very, very important concept that we need to understand because a lot of people, when they come to talk to us, they will say things like, well, I've been, um, I'm under bad influences. I think, I know that people are like doing things to me or, you know, and they speak as if they are passive boards. You know, there's nothing that they can do. And the point is that we are passive as long as we are open to these vibrations. So when we think of Jesus, and there is a passage from one of the books by Emmanuel that we read here a couple of times and cited in our lectures, a passage that says that the light can go deep, in the, uh, deep into very dark and dirty regions and comes out of it still light. So when you are light, when you are love, you can receive all kinds of vibrations. You can be in the darkest place that you don't, that doesn't change your nature. You become, you continue to be what you are, light. So yes, we can be receiving all kinds of vibrations in the same way that we are sending these vibrations, but we are not passive to them. If our level of vibration, which truly means our, what we are feeling, the bottom line of this whole discussion, the bottom line of this idea here is what do we feel? It's truly about what we feel and who we are in essence. Because we talk about thoughts, but what is behind the thoughts? What gives the thoughts color? What gives the thought form is the feeling. And the feeling resides in the spirit. And that's the source, the true source of the work. Now I have a question. I'm going to open the questions with one question. Marcel, you want to join us? Okay, so when you spoke, let me see, my notes is a mess. Okay, you spoke about the deeper feelings and the deeper feelings being able to um, the energize the electron to a, a point where the electron is able to jump, right? And then in this jumping, there is the production of light. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. What if was a bad feeling? What is the outcome? Still light. Okay. Still light. Uh, yeah, technically it's still light. It's just that the visibility of the light changes. You see, I can have a blue light, a white light, yellow light, they're all lights. But they don't come out the same way. You don't see them the same way. Okay? So the aura, which that's going to dictate how the aura is going to be, is going to be one way or another, depending on the kind of light generated. Open to you. <coughs> John. Well, you give this, as, this fellow who wrote the book, you're, you're telling about his book. Yeah. And these dendrites doing when they go up and they wait for something to happen? Well, did you look at the dendrites? 
Yeah, no, science knows about them. It's a known thing, but they don't know why they go up and what, they, what they're doing when they're not resting, per se. Science doesn't know because it's energy. It's, ener it's floating energy that comes in. That's what Andrea Luis tells us. And in science, you can, in a microscope, you can tell what it is. So in the book, what it says is the only thing I can think of is if, when they go up, they're receiving or ready to receive some sort of uh, higher uh, energy. He uses the words. In, I think I have a copy of the book here. He uses the words spirit, God. He gives a list of words because obviously he's not, you know, making uh, aligning with anybody. But he uses these words because that's his only explanation to it after all these years of studying it. Hold on one second, just a second, because Terry has reasons in there. Uh, I want to come back to the, uh, it took me there were two very powerful slides there, and that was that when Lutz was demonstrating the, the, the one slit and the impact of the uh, water wave with one slit, and then the next the slide was the impact with two slits. Two slits. Uh, it brought immediately to my mind uh, that part of Matthew uh, where Jesus said that if I know. when two or more yes. gather in my name, in my name yeah, yeah. Yes. Exactly. and ask anything, it will be given unto you. And that just... The, I was multiplying in my head two and four and eight and sixteen and what collectively how powerful we can be when we unite and ask for one viable good thought. Thought, yeah, exactly. Uh, we see in the last, I would say, maybe twenty years. There's been a lot more of these uh, people getting together to do collective prayers and making things happen. Uh, of all of these, to me, personally, to myself, the most impressive one was in 1997 in the city of uh, County Bluffs, in Iowa. Okay? It was just like an 80,000 people city. It's a small city, 80,000, 90,000. But for some reason, the crime rate was too high for that population, percent-wise. And uh, somebody, I don't remember who, one of these great gurus of our times uh, in India was trying to do experiments in, in you know, collective prayer. And he heard about this. And he, so what he said, what he did is he collected 70 people, supposedly of higher awareness, not all Hindus, Catholics and different people from different religions, just people with higher awareness. And he brought these people into the city for 10 days. Nobody knew about this. Uh, on the first day, the, the purpose was to have these 70 people praying 24 hours a day, in shifts, obviously. That's why they needed so many people, right? So after the first day of prayer, after the first couple of days of prayer, the crime rate started to go down by itself. And like after a few days, the police couldn't explain why it was going down. They didn't know. Uh, it was a good thing, so nobody kind of did anything. And so then they left. Ten days later, they left, the 70 people. The crime rate went back to normal, all, all the way up again. And then this guy came back and explained, this is what we did. That's why the crime rate was all the way down. Just pray, nothing else. So that's the power of prayer, as we say. Yes. Broader, there's a, in one of our long projects where he states that human beings collectively can alter the atmosphere of our very planet. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Um, it's the number of slits. Each one has a mental state. When you propagate your mental state, and I propagate the same, and he propagates the same, you will add, right? Like just like the waves, the uh, water waves, you will add collectively. You will have a much broader impact than one of us or two 
That's the idea of doing collective things. S since this experiment in 1997 in Iowa, uh, a lot of people are doing this in different areas. Uh, they did a couple of years ago in D.C. And the rates in the crime rate in D.C., Washington, D.C. went down because of that. Nothing else. No more police on the street. Not this. They didn't put any more police officers on the street. They didn't do anything different. Just pray. It was two years ago in D.C. So we know. We know. We see the results. Okay. We might not have the complete explanation as human beings, although as we do, you know, we know what go, goes behind the scenes. But the society doesn't really know. And what we see are the results. You mentioned, I have to use this. No, it's just a thing here. Uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, you mentioned something about, uh, for example, the change. If I'm suffering from, for example, a cancer, I can be cured by the way I... You can cure yourself. What I would like to, uh, maybe to add to your lecture is, sometimes this thing doesn't happen. Yeah. Even with my D, Wishing to be cured because of the because there is many many points in this equation, and because we think like oh my God he was a profound prayer, a man of awareness, a beautiful soul, and he constantly were praying for his cure, but he died of cancer, mm -hmm. and we think he failed. The spirit never dies, so he doesn't fail. He might be. One of the cases, I am not like putting this in the box, <laughs> might be the tremendous level of saturation and the same kind of behavior for many, many lives. Mm -hmm. Maybe the disease that the person is facing at the moment is the cure for the spirit. Because it's going to make us more humble, it's going to make us more aware of things that will transcend this lifetime. And many times people say, oh my God, so pray doesn't help if I am suffering from some kind of disease. <laughs> of course it helps a lot because it will benefit first and foremost us as a spirit, as a mortal spirit. So this is what I would like to add. Yeah, no, absolutely. Right. absolutely right. It is not only um, uh, getting better because the person is becoming more humble or whatever, because a lot of times People won't accept the disease, yes. and they will, you know. Get, yeah. But what happens, physio physiologically speaking, is all the disharmonies that are being concentrated in the pure spirit, in the, mm -hmm. the the bodies that you present, they're being drained to the body. So we, the, the body is getting sicker and sicker, but the spirit, the it's energy, is getting, getting healthier. Yeah. And that's one thing that people a lot of time question the diseases and the role of the disease and is there a God, how can that be happening? Yes. Not understanding that it's a blessing in the sense that the body is absorbing those energies that we ourselves created. Are changing our inner. And that's another thing that I had written down because that goes into also the concept of divine justice. Because, you know, a lot of times people will question God's justice when, you know, dealing with diseases. And the justice is in the law. Yeah. And the law is we are free to, to sow, but, you know, we're going to have to reap whatever we have sown. So we are free to, to hate. But when you said, when I saw you doing the same lecture a while back, when you're hating, you're also telling your one trillion cells the message is hate. Yeah. And so they all get into that state of uh, disharmony. And all that is being archived in our, you know, is being stored in our spiritual being. So eventually, we're going to have to to drain Bring all out, yeah. that energy. And that's what the physical body helps us with, to, you know, and yeah, that, that's why I put here that the body is the blood and paper. And the, right, exactly. That's the idea. And the first one to be bombarded by the bad energies that we are throwing away, it's going to be us. Mm -hmm. So that's we are the first victims. We are the first victims. Right. Absolutely. I'll pass to Abraham one second. And that's why, um, again, when we talk about forgiveness, right? Talking about forgiveness. Forgiveness is an act of self love. Because once you get rid of the resentment, once you can overcome that, 
basically you send your own body a message of love and healing and freedom. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, um, I just want to offer you a, a personal testimony. In, in 2007, I, I developed a, 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 a growth on my palate, a palate on my vocal cords. We uh -huh. couldn't hear you at the time. Yes, and I sounded like... No, I can hear you now. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I sounded like I had a, a cold, a cold, a wound in my voice. Uh -huh. And uh, my doctor was in the Sylvester Cancer Center. So when I want to see him the first time, I'm going into the Sylvester Cancer Center and I'm thinking, I have cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now he examines me and he tells me that I have a complicated situation. I have to come back in a month. During that month, I had a dream, and in that dream, a spirit came to me and said, maybe you should watch what you're talking about while you're waiting for the visit. And I woke up and I remembered the dream. When I go back to the doctor, he says to me, he got very upset, and he said to me, where did you get your polyp treated because it has been radiated? So I said, I don't know what you're talking about. And he took a picture of it. And he took a picture of it the first time I went. And he showed me, this is the tissue you had, and this is radiated tissue you have now. So where did you get it treated? It just so happens that I said to him, uh, in another two months, there will be a conference of doctors in 2008 in the, the Hilton Hotel. Mm -hmm. And he said to me that he had never met a spiritist who had actually had uh, uh, health healing, but he had been reading case studies. Mm -hmm. So he already had an idea, and he went to that conference. And that's just a, uh, I wanted to share that with you because all the time that this was happening, I thought that I would not be able to go to the lecture because I was eventually going to do this. Yeah, what a beautiful example. Yeah. <laughs> but I stopped the rebellion. The rebellion that I was experiencing, which I was talking the way I was talking, mm -hmm. I stopped it because of the dream and the experience. You so stopped that, feeding the idea. Yeah. That was the treatment that I needed to stop treat, behaving that way. I needed that experience to change my mind. Your, your thought, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you stopped feeding the process. Yeah, yeah. Elaine. It's so very important. A lot of times what happens is you're feeling more of the pain of what the problem is than what the solution is. So it's very difficult sometimes for us who are not healed, and maybe because we're thinking about the problem and not just feeling well, you know, you have to feel that you're okay, you have to know that you're okay, and then you'll be okay. Just like Abraham, he just said, hmm, I know I'm okay. And you'll feel the feelings, and everything comes back to you. It's about these feelings that you have. You have to feel that you are well, and then you will be well. Yeah, there are a lot of studies in the biology, molecular biology, about uh, how you perceive yourself, yourself, how you see yourself, and the impact that it has on yourself. They're doing this at the physical level, it's molecular biology, but what triggered the study are cases like this. They want to know, they want to know more about it at their level, obviously, but you know, it's a known thing today that you know your body will stand what your thoughts are, what your feelings are. There are, there are many discoveries and many findings that are taking place at this moment. Researchers left and right around the globe are happening. And what Lewis brought to us today, it's not the end of the story. Oh. He just brought us a little slice of what is being offered through science in what we all know deep inside, deep inside since the beginning. When Jesus brought to us the message, love your neighbor as you love yourself, he was bringing us the essence of a code, of a moral and ethical code that we should follow. But not only through Christianity, this moral and ethical code it's insert in every human being around the globe and we can follow or not and this is the most important things because we choose we kind of what kind of path are we going to walk and might have people doing their own researches when you see dr emoto which is a japanese when you see the research that he took and he put in place 
when people pray, when people wishes bad thoughts, emit with this emission of bad thoughts, how we transform water. And since our body is 70% of water, 80%, between 70 and 80% of water, we can see how our thoughts can be having an impact on everything that is inside of our cells, our body. So we choose where we are going. And of course, this is very limited. I mean, like, it's, it's of course, the discussions are gonna keep on going, but we are the masters of our lives, and we can give the directions according to our wish. Of course, it takes many lives. It will take a lot of times, as Susanna said, this is something that goes deep inside because we have a baggage of emotions, of many lives, of many behaviors, sometimes constant behaviors, behaving in a bad way, and now it's changed for us at least to try to change, at, like, at least try to think about it. I might be going in the wrong direction. So it's up to us to Yes, because sometimes you say, well, you know, we need to wish differently. Well, we do, don't we? Of course. <laughs> and why can we change? <laughs> Remember Paul the Apostle, uh, what I wish to do good, I don't do. But what I don't wish, what is the phrase? Is the, you all know. What I, I want to do good, but I don't do. But I wish, you know what I mean. <laughs> no, we don't. I don't know. Goodness, we want to do wish we not Wrongdoing that we do not want to do that one. Thank you, Bita. Thank it. you very That's much. It. Thank you very much. So it's a process <laughs> taking place. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult to make a change, obviously, because we tend, uh, we have a tendency to change what's at the physical level. It's easer because it's visible. So oh, we like changing. To we love to change other people. Uh, that's even worse. We love to change other people. That's even worse, but uh, and sometimes in this in this rush to change, we become being, we becoming uh, become very judgmental with ourselves. We become very harsh, you know, because it's not an intellectual process; it's an emotional process ultimately. And so, you know, if it was intellectual, it would be much easier. I mean, we're in, a, we're in an era of science, and science has not. With all the technology, with all the understanding into matter, into energy, has not made any of us happier. Because that's not where the answer is. No. That helps. That's a, a tool, but it's not the answer. I want to bring up your point now, Because the way I feel, we, we are very good in thinking. We are very good. We master that ability, but we are still in a big steps of feeling. Truly, deliberately feeling, deciding to feel, because many times those feelings are within just the person to be felt. But we resist it, we are scared, we don't know how to. <coughs> so sometimes just put your intention, your goodness, your life, just to feel whatever it is, can be solved. And it's amazing how that happens a lot quicker that all the intellectual understanding we have, we just need to learn to decide to feel. That's yeah, what, th that's what Andrea Luis calls place your attention on your feelings. And that's the expression he uses. That would be, we don't place the attention on feelings. We don't know how yet. Yeah. Oh, we are learning, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, this week, uh, scientists found that the Higgs boson mm -hmm. And the impact that that has is God particle in the waters, the periscopes that we talked about. And it's so refreshing to understand that what Andre Luis was talking about many, many years ago, uh, they are actually beginning to find today, you know, in science. Yeah. Uh, science. This is something we well, we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I want to add that I have time now because I'm, I'm going to need time. Yeah. Okay. I don't, I don't want to be very technical, but it is by default a very technical subject. Okay. We need to understand what is what we are expecting from science and what is science expecting from science. They're different things. We think this is how they're going to find or accept God, and actually, this is going to make them more materialistic. Okay. 
this is what it is. Um, think of an atom, okay? An atom has a mass. So it is considered matter for all purposes because it has a mass. So scientifically, that's what it is. Now, uh, mass, that's also in spiritist books. Right? The spirit will not come the spirit from the spirit, but the body comes from the body. So for them, if something has a mass, it has to come from a combination of other things that has mass. That's their principle, okay? The problem is, the atom has a mass. Where does it come from? We don't know yet. That's them, okay? I'm a full-blown scientist right now talking to you, okay? So, there is no spirit for five minutes. So, the atom comes from a combination of things that have mass. What makes the atom? We don't know. We have to search for it. Then this guy, uh, Higgs, Bob Higgs, he put a theory together about trying to find these other particles that with mass that would create an atom that has a mass. Okay, that would explain at least one level down and then we'll work backwards all the way down and so on and so on. So. Okay, then he wrote a book, uh, then uh, another scientist wrote a book in 1997 about Higgs theory. In this book, I don't know why, he said that the day we find these particles that combine and have mass, create an atom, he called these particles particle of God. It has nothing to do with particle, it has nothing to do with God, but that's the name he gave. We have to go by the name because that's the word out there today in the society, okay? So, uh, the only way the science thought that we are going to find these particles is by destroying the atom. If you destroy the atom, you see what little particles compose the atom. And what they found is the only way to destroy the atom is to have this atom collide with another atom at, a, at such an absurd speed that will destroy both. And what they expected is at the moment of the impact, we would see these particles, but they would recompose themselves and go back to the atoms again. But at least we have a window of time that we can look at to these particles, okay? And find these particles are called boson of Higgs. Then they created this uh, lab in Geneva, 27 kilometers long, to be able to accelerate two electrons and collide them one against the other. That's what they did. They finally found or got to this window of time when these other particles are in existence, apparently, and the atoms are destroyed, okay? So that's what they found. We did destroy the atoms and we found things. These things are supposedly this boson of Higgs. Now, going back to the spirit thing and everything, what does this make science more materialistic? Because they found more particles and less energy. Do you understand that? We were waiting for them to find more energy and less particles. So I personally think that this is going to make science more materialistic than what it is. It's a personal opinion. I think that's what it is, because they found more particles. Now they're going to have to be able to collide two bosom of Higgs to find another one that makes it. You see? So, anyway. I, I think, uh, just another personal opinion, I think that the way for, uh, that we expect that one day science is going to find uh, a spirit or God, whatever word each person wants to use, I, I think it's through genetics. I don't think it's through atoms and collision of atoms. I think it's through genetics. <coughs> because they're getting to a point where nothing is explained anymore. Everything that they created since the... Uh, uh, the discovery of the DNA structure in 1953, nothing works anymore. They can't explain. What about the dark matter? It's the same thing. We, we don't have an answer. They keep looking for an answer based on particles. It's, you see, it's always based on that. The assumption is the problem. They're looking to justify that, oh yeah, no, this is matter. This is matter. Marcelo is matter. I am matter. Because the assumption is to prove that this is matter, not to investigate. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> matter doesn't matter. You know, uh, yeah. we probably will never uh, 
eye, yeah. but yeah. we may never satisfy science. Mm -hmm. But it's about what is internal in you that you know a difference can be made. Well, let, let me tell you this much. Uh, we expect, we especially we spiritists and spiritualists, they're included here too. We expect science to find God, to accept God, to whatever you want to call. But that's not their purpose. You see, you're expecting something from somebody that that somebody is not doing. The, the, you see, it's a spiritism, you have the body, a physical world, and you have a spiritual world. This is studied by science. This is studied by spiritism and all the spiritualists uh, also. Don't expect one of us here in this room to explain biology. The same way, don't explain one of these guys to explain God. You see, it's different things. Yes? There, there, there is, um, I would like to offer this to all of you. There is a small group of scientists that are leaning toward the uh, bridging science and, and uh, spirituality. Spirit. Yeah. And you will find them on a website called TED. Mm -hmm. And I haven't been watching it for three months. And uh, I want to offer it to you because they are lectures like these, without without obviously relating to any kind to, to God or any religion. Mm -hmm. But the the scientist uh, explanation of things, as a spiritist, you know, a little bit, you can relate and you can see the connection. Although the the, the public may not, you would because of your reading and studies. And I and I want to offer it to you because. It is an incredible website. No, thank you. It's called nice. TED.com. TED.com. Technology and entertainment and design. .com. Yeah, and they are the inventors of products and ideas and things that have not come to the public yet. Okay. You want to say something? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh -huh. Here. Since 500 years before Christ, when Democritus and Leucippus try to find and theorize that everything in the world, everything in the universe known, was formed by something called Adam, which is in Greek means indivisible, was a great, great pace in the time of humankind. Now, science still work in the field, trying to break the atom in multiple subparticles. And we know through Crick's and Doubting and many others that we can form an atom, an atom that was formed by protons and neutrons. And then we have many other particles, subparticles, that we are not going to address the question now. Now we have the boson of Higgs. And technically, you can break the particles in less and less and less, because technically, if you have something you can break in two parts, in four parts, in eight, in n parts, until the time that scientists, when the tools of science, which is also an arm of God, if I can say this, because science is a way for us, because we are going to exhaust trying to find this that we call the final frontier and then we will see materialists will prove that this spirit the spiritual realm exists no one can deny through the letters psychographic <coughs> with channeled by mediums for example Chico Xavier when he brought messages messengers messengers from from sons that pass away to that desperate mother with the richness source of details that the spirit cannot it did the spirit does not exist <coughs> and this when science get away from their little box and get more involved in society they will see that we are all interconnected this try uh, aspects of spiritism which is science philosophy and religion will reunite in a way that will prove that we are going to keep living living and living so of course scientists are trying to get more into 
the intimacy of matter and they see more and more particles. More money are being involved and more money is being invested in devices, multi-billionaire devices to see if they can break more and more and more and more particles. And they always can break. They're trying to find God. Not God as we are trying to see God. Because what they are, they are trying to see and to find it's something. If they get out of the box of science, they will reach something much more profound. And I don't know if you want to add something, Susanna, uh, about <coughs> this thought. It's let's not get square in science because we are only going to see science in the material way of seeing. When we are open, we are, we are, when we are uh, sitting the ground, when we are like a, a um, Holistic. Holistic being. We see something much more. I'm not talking here to be like, oh, we're going to have to follow a guru, we have to be meditation, because we're going to have to be in connection with the spiritual realm. It's not about that. It's about you finding ourselves. It's about you finding and to dealing with our emotions and to dealing with something that we don't know yet. But we are learning because we are studying and because this message that echoes in our spirit for many, many centuries, through many, many philosophers. And then came Jesus to make the separation of before him and after him. And now it's time for us to see and to make this wedding with science, with philosophy and religion. Science and philosophy and the base and religion. It comes from the word religare in Latin, means reconnection with the divine, reconnection with the essence that we are all formed. And we see science as a tool, and philosophy is also a tool. When they get together in connecting with the essence of us, which is the religions, we see the tripod. And then we will see something much more brighter and something much more profound that we've been looking for many, many times. As Susanna says, we never had so many technological resources available to us. And men, at this point, didn't get true happiness. We still want more iPads, iPods, technology, beautiful cars, I got, I this, I that. And we still like looking for more and more and more. And we forgot to dive into ourselves. And when we dive into ourselves, this is going to be only one chapter of our existence because we are the image of God. Not the image like my face, my ear. The image because everything that God creates is perfect to be. So I am a perfect to be creature. So I am going forward this direction which is the perfectibility that I want to be one day. It's a matter of time, yes. It will take like millions of years, Yes. I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. But what if millions of years for our immortal soul? So let's start now.